Welcome to Tent Talk, the podcast with Nancy McCrady, where we talk about life under the big tent of God's presence and the provoking process of discipleship. Here we go. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Tent Talk. This is Nancy McCrady. The clarion call is from the Father to you to come to Him. It says in the scripture that He waits for you in the secret place. And this is the aloneness that we have with him that is so powerful if we're going to live the crucified life. I pray you'll respond to him and his call to come to the secret place. And if being alone is something that terrifies you, my friends, he's about to set you free. So take a listen to these two episodes. And I pray that they will encourage you to go deeper with Him and to stay with Him and remain with Him and that He will be enough that you will decide, oh yes, He is enough for me. Love you all. Okay, let us continue in talking about what I would call this birthright of love. So let me start out reading some scripture. Don't let that deter you, all right? We need to know the Word of God. We need to live in the Word of God. We need to let the Word of God remind us of that which is true and the focus uh, of what God is doing in us. So let me read first out of John 17, verses 21 through 26 in the Amplified Classic. This is Jesus praying. Now remember, if a man is about to die... And his lips start moving and he's praying. You'd want to lean in, wouldn't you, and hear what he's saying? And we get that privilege right here in John 17. The whole point of why Jesus is going to the cross is upon his lips. It's in his heart. It's on his mind. And this is what he says. That they all may be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us so that the world may believe and be convinced that you have sent me. I have given to them the glory and honor which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, in order that they may become one and perfectly united, that the world may know and definitely recognize that you sent me and that you have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have entrusted to me, as your gift to me, may be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, which you have given, which you have given me, your love gift to me. For you have loved me before the foundation of the world. O just and righteous Father, although the world has not known you and has failed to recognize you and has never acknowledged you, I have known you continually, and these men understand and know that you have sent me. I have made your name known to them and revealed your character and your very self, and I will continue to make you known that the love which you have bestowed upon me may be in them, felt in their hearts, and that I myself may be in them." So this is very powerful, this prayer of Jesus. Now let's see that that prayer has been answered in uh, those early sons, if you will, uh, and again, that it is also set aside for us to know this. So here we see in 1 John 4, 16 through 19, one of those speaking who was with Jesus Uh, in those days that he prayed the prayer in John 17. And this is what he says about himself and the company that he keeps. 1 John 4, 16 through 19 in the Amplified. And we know, understand, recognize, are conscious of, by observation and by experience, and believe, adhere to, and put faith in and rely on the love God cherishes for us. God is love, and he who dwells and continues in love dwells and continues in God, and God dwells and continues in him. In this union and communion with him, 
Love is brought to completion and attains perfection with us, that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, with assurance and boldness to face him, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. But full-grown, complete, perfect love turns fear out of doors and expels every trace of terror. For fear brings with it the thought of punishment. And so he who is afraid has not reached the full maturity of love, is not yet grown into love's complete perfection. We love him because he first loved us. (laughs) Okay, so like, That's like 10 sermons right there, so I could break into that. But let me continue in what we're doing here today. You see, as Jesus prayed in John 17, he was calling out for sons like himself for the Father. He was praying that the oneness he had with the Father as a human son would be the mark upon the sons that were going to be made into his image. He prayed they would know the love of the Father, the love that is the Father. You see, Jesus is the only one, Son of God, Son of Man, but He never was meant to be the only human Son who lived in deep oneness with the Father. This is why He came, and earlier in Romans 8, which on our previous episode we talked about some verses out of Romans 8, and if you go back a little further in Romans 8, in Romans 8, 29, it says that uh, Jesus would become, might become the firstborn of many brethren. You see, Jesus was to be the first born from the dead that that uh, was born into this and became the head of this new race, this new breed of person. Uh, in Ephesians 2, in the Message Bible, it says that God uh, created an entirely new kind of human being, giving every person a fresh start in him. So wherever you are today, a fresh start waits for you, no matter what. All right? Now, it's God's way, through God's means, through God's provision. It's not just because you shake off the uh, nasty feelings of whatever you've been in. It's not just because you determine that today is going to be a new day for you. No, it's because there's a fresh start in Christ and in Him only is that able to come forward. So you see that this love keeps coming up, this love of God, that is our birthright. Jesus lived in the birthright of love, not the earned love, the deserved love, the birthright of love by the sheer fact that you have been born again, uh, that you uh, by birth, okay, are given this right and privilege to be known as the sons of God and to receive, have the capacity now to receive that love. Previously, when we're born first in Adam, we reject this love. We totally reject it because we want to earn our own love. I should be good enough to to make people love me. When you're born again, you're in the birthright of love. You see, without the love of God, there would be no sun, no cross, no blood, no life. If there was not the love of God, it says that because he loved the world, he sent his son. You you see, sometimes we act like it's just because God loves me, he forgives me. No, no, because he loved, he sent the son as a sacrifice because the sacrifice had to be made. Things had to be dealt with. Things had to be paid for. So sometimes we just, we we get way down in something that's not of God. No, because of his great love, he sent the son. God does not forgive you just because he loves you. He can only forgive you because there was a son sent by love to be the full sacrifice, to make payment, to, to shed his blood and let his body be broken you see, we if we're not careful, we get into this ooey-gooey, simple, shallow, you know, just God loves me, therefore, no matter what I do, He's just going to... No, no. Because He loved you, He sent the Son. As they had prophesied, as they had promised, as they spoke of it, as they planned for it, as they fulfilled the law themselves, as they required of themselves, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they required of themselves that which was necessary, so that you could be brought back into oneness. See, this birthright of love is what provides the cross, the blood, the life. 
it's Galatians 5, 6 that tells us there's no uh, faith without love, meaning that faith is energized and activated by the very love of God. So who is this son, this Jesus, that prays like this for us in John 17, that doesn't want to keep anything that's his to himself? (laughs) I love this. My only hope of being a one who shares uh, is sharing in the life of Jesus, the very nature of Jesus. God is our big sharing God. Everything he is, everything he has is shared with us, but it is shared, my friends, in Christ and Christ only. You see, there's something so powerfully pleasing to the Father about Jesus. He calls him the Beloved. Jesus knew he'd been loved before the foundations of the world. That's what we heard in John 17. And the love that they shared transcended the boundaries of time and space. Jesus spoke of his Father's love often. In John 3.35, he said, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. John 5.20 says, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. John 14.30, Jesus said, Now the reciprocal, I love this. This is what we want to have and live in. So in John 14.30, Jesus said, I love the Father, and as the Father gave me uh, the commandment, even so I do. All right, and and I love that in John fourteen thirty and thirty one, Jesus says, "This is how the world will know that I love the Father." See, the Father loves Jesus, yes, but how shall the world know that I love the Father? That I am reciprocal in this uh, love is I'm going to follow my Father's orders. I, I'm going to carry out that which He has given me to do. At His baptism in Luke three twenty one and twenty two, His first public appearance. Um, this love is publicly declared for all to hear by the Father about His Son. And here's where you see the Godhead moving together, all three of them. It says, Heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon Him, the Son, in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came out of heaven. There's the Father. Thou art my beloved Son, in Thee I am well pleased. See, the Father makes sure they know the love that He has for Him as he begins his journey to the cross to fulfill why it is that he came. You see, they are wildly and publicly making their love for each other well known. It's not going to be determined by the events that are about to unfold, meaning, oh, he must not love you. Look how he's letting you suffer. No, because of our great love for those whom we've come for, uh, we will suffer. Mm. Oh, this is maturing love. The Father gazes upon Jesus the Son and doesn't wish for him to be a bit more. There are no lingering wishes for someone or something better. Here we behold total satisfaction expressed. Jesus hasn't done anything yet, right? He hasn't done anything yet, but the Father says, Now, he has my full approval. Who he is is pleasing to me. Hmm? You see, on the Mount of Transfiguration, the Father says it again. He says, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. That's what He says in Matthew 17, 5. The Father's like, listen to my Son. But how was it, even in the common tasks of an ordinary life, that Jesus drew the praise of heaven? You see, at the core of His being, He did only those things that pleased the Father. In everything, He stayed true, heartbeat to heartbeat, with the Father's desires. Jesus lived for the Father alone. The Father was enough for him. I'm going to submit to you, though, that God is not enough for most Christians. The majority of Christians, God is not enough. What God brings to them is enough. Having experiences, events, things to look forward to, things that juice the soul, this is what pleases most Christians. When that begins to be withdrawn, when they begin to go into the weaning time of being weaned away from those felt things, oh, it can get very, very intense. And we grapple and claw and scratch and and look to regain what I call the early days of our first love. Not our first love. I just want the early days. I want the early feelings. I want... I want, uh, you know, quick answers to my prayers and everything brought to the crib and all the milk put in my mouth. Don't make me reach for anything. Don't make me do anything. Don't make me endure anything. That's what most people are trying to get back to. I want the early days of the felt presence of God, the felt love of God, the proven love of God. 
But God says, come with me, sons, come with me. I'm going to wean you and bring you to the place that you and I are together, and you're going to know. You're going to know me. You're going to know. You're going to know the love that I have for you. You see, this is the key for Jesus, is that the Father was enough for him. You see, God had a human son that valued his birthright of love more than anything this world had to offer. And because of that, he desired nothing more than to please the Father. This was what Jesus lived in. And my friends, that's what we're called to live in. If your Christianity is taking you to any other end other than oneness with the Father, I'd have to provoke you to say, what, what are you headed for? Hmm? What have you made your goal? Hmm? Is it him? And is it to know him? Because I know that's his his heart's desire with you. You see, because as Jesus lived, my friends, that's how we're called to live. If we're his disciples, this is true discipleship, is we are following after him so that we can live like him. This is what they can do. They can produce sons that hell is not going to be able to seduce away. They can do that. It can happen. You see, Jesus knew it was his birthright to be loved. He never had to earn it, perform for it, or strive to achieve it. And he knew that he was made to live out of knowing that he was loved and actually experiencing that love. And because the Father was the well of all that he needed and all that he was meant for, he knew he was made for him as a human son. God was enough for Jesus. My question is, is he enough for you? Is he enough? I think I'll leave it there today, and we'll pick up again in the next episode. Think on these things with him and continue on. Love you all. For more information on Nancy, please visit nancymccrady.com or follow her on social media at nbmccrady.com.